Good morning, everyone. Welcome to S3 Higher Education Chat, October edition. Today, we'll be talking about turning data into meaningful information. Now, we all know how important it is to create meaningful maps and teach the skills to the students. So maybe many of you are already familiar with S3 Living Atlas of the World that have a rich collection of highly recorded maps and data. We are fortunate today to have Jim Harris, principal product engineer from Living Atlas team. He will lead us into the topics. And after Jim presentation, before the QA, we will have Laura Bowden, which is K16 program coordinator to share resources. Laura has written some lessons based on Living Atlas of the World that you can use for teaching and learning. Now, during the presentation, please again, mute your phone and feel free if you want to type your question on the chat, we will cover it at the end. And we will also have the live QA at the end as well. With this, I'm gonna stop sharing and let Jim start. Jim, take away. Okay, let me give it a shot here. Can you hear me all right? Yes. And can you see a slide that says hello? Yes. All right, we're off to a good start. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Harris. I'm a geographer at Esri since 1995. Uh, previously, I spent time with Dwayne Marble at uh, The Ohio State University, Randy Jackson, Randy Johnson, let's see who else, uh, Morton O'Kelly, some really great folks there who uh, shaped my perspective on geography. And in my role now, I look um, as a product engineer, I've been making maps long enough and leading projects involving how do we turn this data into information um, long enough that I start to see reasons why people or processes do not result in great maps. I pay attention to those things and I try to take those lessons learned back to the software team or back to a data team and discuss here's the points of friction I'm seeing and why these maps aren't as good as they could be. So uh, just other little facts about me, working on a regional geography textbook with uh, Macmillan, that uh, we hope will come out in a couple of years um, or sooner. Um, I am married to an educator, so that affects my work. Uh, she works with uh, kids who need a little more help or who are gifted and need a little different kind of help. Um, and that affects my work in this way. I really take a close look at, um, you know, the signal we're trying to send with a map is sometimes not the signal received on the other end, whether that's due to color blindness or just a lack of um, background knowledge about a topic, um, whatever it is, it kind of shapes it. So I love to make maps and, and I've always loved GIS for what I, I can get it. out of it. Karina, um, I, the analogy I use is that uh, if somebody could check their mute, that would be useful. Thank you. Um, I've always loved GIS for what I can get out of it because it has such amazing powers. And the technology has changed so much over the years. Um, the analogy I use is I've become one of those person who I'm on the, the side of a river of technology going by. You know, when I started, it was ARC Info, and you were judged by how many ARC Info commands you could name and use from memory. And then uh, ArcView came along and Avenue came along and I spent a couple of years learning that and then Visual Basic and Map Objects and then uh, COM models and ArcGIS 8 and then the, the internet and the web and uh, boy, all this technology just keeps changing. And I started to realize, I think I want to stay here on the riverbank as the river of technology goes by. I just I want to make sure I'm focused on geography and making great maps. I've um, got some contact information there for you um, in case you want to reference these slides later. And let's go to the next one. One of the things we try to focus on, on uh, at Esri and in my team, um, I'm on the team called ArcGIS Living Atlas, is that a great map is a window into information. And so it's the picture, it's the immediate back of the room at a glance. Can I see what's going on in this map? Does the title, you know, this is transit stops and areas served in San Francisco. Yeah, this is in San Francisco. Those are all the transit lines. And uh, at the time this map was made, there was a proposed new line to go along here. 
And so we thought we'd make a map that kind of illustrates that. Or another map showing volcanoes and the relationship to population. And both these layers come from ArcGIS Living Atlas. Why don't I pop over and show what that is? ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World, you can see it here at livingatlas.arcgis.com. And uh, it's got about 8,000 different maps and layers that are selected because they're either the best of what's available uh, on a global topic or a national or regional topic or even a local topic. And you can go here anytime you want. It's uh, available to anybody. But if you are uh, an ArcGIS user, um, you can log in and save your work, right? That's one of the benefits of having a login. You can come here. And uh, if you're new to Living Atlas, what I'd recommend is just hang out on the home page. This changes uh, pretty often, like every week, there's also, there's always a new thing. We just worked on this air quality app, for example, about uh, a week ago, and we had 72 hours to put it together. And uh, we were able to get that done. Um, and it's a really neat app where the underlying layers, and here's the key point of today, the underlying layers in this app are in the Living Atlas and available to you as well. So you can consume this information as an application because in some cases we would go ahead and take a great layer and we'll try to make a great information product out of it to show where is problematic air quality in the United States as of this morning. That's part of the Living Atlas is hooking into this uh, EPA Air Now feed. And that's a good point. What is the Living Atlas? The Living Atlas is data you own. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of it is federal data that your tax dollars pay for, or state data, or local government data. This is the data you've paid for. You have a right to see it, you've got a right to use it, and we hope you are creative, and your students are creative in the uses of it, such as examples like this. And that's why we put these applications up here, is part of the Living Atlas story is to inspire, give you ideas of various apps. Uh, the Apps tab is a great place for you to bookmark, because again, we're always adding new apps. Uh, we recently released a Esri COVID Pulse application where it takes a look at the weekly update that my colleague Charlie Fry uh, runs the numbers every week. And it's uh, got a particular graphic called a spark line where we see in North Dakota, you can just see by the symbol, the number of cases and et cetera, is going up pretty significantly. Also Wisconsin, you may have heard about this in the news or if you live in those states, you're probably aware of it. We're here in Southern California and this has been my experience that overall in the state, the rates are going down, but I don't live in a state, I live in a county. Actually, I live in a house and the house is on a street and the street is in a census block and the block is in a block group and a tract and a county and I've just lost half the audience unless you love census. But this data is available and interactive. So part of the Living Atlas is to provide these apps to give inspiration to what can be done these days with maps and applications. Um, and in many cases, we provide a download link so you can um, uh, get the code. Um, if you've got somebody interested in modifying an app, all these apps are available. I think uh, the World Imagery Wayback app is one of uh, Dr. Kursky's favorites, if I'm not mistaken. Wayback app is cool. You can go to any area of the country and kind of go back in time down the left side here to see what did this look like in 2016. And you can pull that image and actually put it into um, a web map for your use, which is kind of nice. So what kind of data and maps are available in Living Atlas? Just a real quick tour of this browse page. Um, this is where a lot of people hang out. So if you want to um, go from the headlines, there's a hurricane brewing and uh, headed towards the New Orleans area. Um, we have uh, the ability for you to just type in a search term and find out what's available. In this case, we have a live feeds layer. We have a web map where someone has taken the live feeds and authored a map that you can just plug in and use. Um, we've got several of those actually. So if I were to just touch that as a student of yours, I can see a description of what it is. I could find out the data source for it. And most importantly, I can open it up and take a look at it. 
And this is something I might take a screenshot of. I might uh, um, use the print function to print it to a document so that I've got a record of what this looked like on this day. Because this is a live feed. Obviously, it's going to change from hour to hour. So we're, we're very appreciative on the Living Atlas team of our opportunity to work on these kinds of things. And the way it ties back into today's topic, how can it work with you? I want to give you a quick little demo of, uh, let's do this one, the volcanoes and the population layer. Okay. So I'm going to turn that one off. This is this uh, web scene, it's called. And I'm going to go up here to the top left and say modify scene. And I'm going to hit this button called add layer. And in our Esri applications that allow you to build maps, you'll usually find uh, an ability to add, you know, my content. This is stuff that you've uploaded to your account or the organization you're a part of may have created some layers and made them available to you. ArcGIS Online itself has got something like 25 million layers in it. So that's a lot. But Living Atlas has about uh, six, seven, eight thousand layers you could use. So if I wanted to look for population related figures, I've got quite a bit. And this particular representation, you see, we're looking at Japan, right? You can see, I believe it's Tokyo right here. Um, this layer, I believe, comes from the World Population Density Estimate from Esri. I think I recolored it a little bit. So that layer is available to anybody in the Living Atlas to just find and add. Now, does that mean you should not teach your students to search out data on the internet and download it or FTP it? Do they still teach FTP? Anyway, download is still a thing. Totally get it. I think uh, we were commiserating as a team about our early days in GIS. And I remember Dwayne Marble having me um, hand digitize the counties of New Mexico. And I was so excited to do it. It was old school. It was like, wow, I get to use this digitizer. Digitized it. We evaluated its accuracy or the accuracy of my work. And do you know how many things I've digitized since that lesson? Zero. And that's okay. I've sketched some things. But what I learned and appreciated was how powerful data is, how much work goes into creating good data. And so to have thousands of layers available now where I can just go do a query and say, here's population and uh, what's our topic? Volcanoes. And I believe we have some um, significant global volcanic eruptions from NOAA that uh, is available here. I can kind of see what the layer is and its sources. Yeah, that's worth a shot. Let me hit the add data button. And it's going to try to add those. I see it has added them. Nice. So with just a couple of clicks, I've got the layer. Let's see if the map author or the layer author bothered to author a pop up. They did. Oh, how nice. They gave me the date. They wrote sentences. And that's a good form. I like that form. Um, this is one of the pop-ups uh, when we say a great map is a window into information. When you click on a map, that's so different than um, a print map. I love print maps. They're so rich with information, but like the one behind me, once it's printed, that's it. It gets no more updates unless I have a pen or a Sharpie, I guess. So what do I love about a pop-up? I, as a map author, once I become familiar with this data, this is a map of population density, um, I can tr try to help the user understand the topic. Topic. So many of us in geography, we know what population density is, right? We've, we've seen it, we've talked about it. And yet what does, let's see, I clicked on an area. What does 26,236.5 people per square mile, what does that feel like, right? Like if I say 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, some of us on this call know I'm talking about body temperature. And in that context, if I said, Joseph has 101 degree body temperature this morning, we all know something about Joseph now. He's not feeling so good. It's not true, right, Joseph? He can't get to the mute. All first. good, Jim. I'm good. Glad to hear it, Joseph. But in that context, 98.6 is a standard of comparison. It has a scientific basis. It has a reason to be discussed. People are familiar with it. I learned about body temperature 
and the meaning of 98.6 when I was in about sixth grade and tried to con my mom into telling her I was sick and I couldn't go to school. And she busted out the thermometer and uh, I went to school. So what does that have to do with pop density? Well, probably none of us know what the population density of our census block is or our block group, our tract, and arguably, who cares? Why should you know? Well, what you should know is that people have a need to relate to the data and maps you're showing. So I bothered to write, I actually bothered to do an equation and figure out if you've got a pop density of 26,000 persons per square mile, I just kind of wondered if we were all literally in that one in that area and we all spread out evenly how many feet would there be between us and the answer is in this case there'd be about 33 feet between each person so that's a little more relatable expression of that what do we need in order to make good information products out of maps i mean if you take it as a given that living atlas is one collection of very useful data and maps and layers they're ready to use you don't even need to download you just add layer, and there it is, it's in your map, and you can move on to the next step, whether you're just trying to visualize something or you're trying to analyze something. The data's there, and the technology is here and available online or on desktops and workstations. Certainly, society has needs, and there are a lot of decision makers in place looking to be fed information in order to inform their decisions. So if this environment is right for the taking, if we're ready to contribute with maps and analysis, what do we need? And I drew this diagram because this is the thing I consistently run into. We need people with ideas. We need people with map skills and we need people with data skills. And yet it's kind of hard to find somebody who's got all three. I don't know if you found that to be true, but that's probably why you're in the industry you are in. You want to help create those people. We want to help you as well. We want people who can kind of sense and feel comfortable putting data into motion, into a map, and into their ideas, bringing it all together. Ideas like this. This is a map I heard. And when I say I heard it, I meant, I mean, I'm sitting in a meeting and people are talking about um, uh, disparities in society and how rail, sometimes rail yards have uh, diesel engines that are sitting idling on the tracks days and hours long, just constant spewing of PM 2.5 and PM 10 pollution in the area. And uh, so it got me thinking, oh, I wonder how many people live within a quarter mile of a railroad or within a half mile or within one mile. So on this map, red is a quarter mile. You live within a quarter mile. Those are census block points. And yellow, orange is um, within a half mile, et cetera. So, so what? Why am I showing you this? Well, let's close this thing and uh, let's go to that map and show it. So this is the end product, I feel like a, a cooking show where I show you the final you know, meal first and then we go back and do some ingredients. Um, where this comes from, you can do all of this online. If I go to browse the living atlas and I'm gonna take a quick search for census uh, blocks and I've got them either as uh, polygons All right, so there they are. And draw. So now you've got a bunch of polygons on the map. And I believe we also have um, this, actually, I wanna do this with broadband because we recently published some FCC form 477 fixed broadband, both as a polygon layer and also as a feature layer. A feature layer just means there are attributes on that data. So this is just like loading a shape file or a file geo database into a desktop um, scenario. So I've got this and uh, I've got all these broadband care. Let's turn off the, uh, the final cake and just show you the raw ingredient. So now I've got the two ingredients I need, right? Um, I've got the USA Railroads, which is also available in the Living Atlas. I can go to the item details for that if I forget where it came from and it'll show me 
It's got a little badge that says, yeah, this is in the Living Atlas from authoritative source. Um, okay, and then the analysis part, there's this analysis tool available where I can say, well, um, I'm interested in the proximity. Maybe I wanna create buffers around it. Or the other way to go is uh, under summarized data, you can do a join where I say, take the railroads and, uh, uh, is it railroads? I think, I always forget. Well, it's gotta be one or the other. Um, let's take the census tracks and use the railroads and we're gonna do a spatial relationship where we wanna know which one is within uh, 0.25 miles, kilometers, meters, whatever you want. And in this case, I'll just use the current map extent for time's sake. And I did this before, so it warns me try two. Let's do the second try. So while we're talking, this request has now gone up to servers in the cloud. The analysis um, was uh, sent up there, and it's going to now take a look for the straight line between any red line on this screen and any census block it can find in the area. Make sense? So we'll come back to that in a second. I think it takes about 30 seconds total. The point is that these layers are not just pretty pictures or raw data. They're actually layers you can analyze and do work with. Um, part of the Living Atlas, it's the reason it exists is to sort of inspire others. And also when we get inspired, we want to echo that. This is work done by Bob Geralt at Esri's Application Prototype Lab. He had an amazing RTS Pro tool that allows us to take um, information like this showing flows of people from one state to another and create this sort of, I don't know what the right word is, it looks like a lightning bolt across the country. And that's on purpose. We wanted to kind of create that effect. Hey, my result's done. So now I can just fin finish symbolizing this um, any way I want. So I would jump in here. I don't know, for time's sake, we'll just do that, right? And so now those are all the census blocks that are within a quarter mile of a railroad. And I can open up that table. And if it has population on it, then I could sum up the total population in an area, right? So this is in the area of kind of getting some quick, quick and dirty answers done um, just using the online query capabilities. Okay. Looks like I don't have what I wanted there. That's fine. Okay, so let's go on to, yeah, this is the state migration flows. So this started out life um, as this, right? And what I'd love for your students coming out of school to be able to do is kind of connect all the dots between when they see a page like this showing we've got migration data from the IRS of all people um, showing how many tax returns uh, changed address example from New York to California or something like that and they provide it in all these downloadable links I want your students to be able to envision information products like this where I can pick whatever state I want and it's going to have an interactive experience to tell me um, how many inbound and how many outbound people moved to and from Wyoming right and how do we get them? Well, one way we get them is we show them examples to kind of fire their thinking, get them thinking uh, creatively. And that's what we kind of um, encourage and, and desire. So the current situation today, um, we run into this all the time where people who want to map COVID, people who want to map the economy, um, job changes, et cetera, they always want to know what the current situation is. So give me today's numbers. And Living Atlas has many, many useful sources of the latest available numbers. Then they want to know, what does it mean? What does population density mean? What does COVID cases per 100,000 mean or deaths per 100,000 mean? And then it always leads to that third question. Well, what do we expect? And which way are things going? Right? We don't map just to make the map. We also want to give people a hint about which way things are going. So a couple of examples. This was a map we did for some um, judges in California. They had noticed in their data 
that there was a disparity in terms of the number of filled judgeship positions. So how many judges are available? How many open positions? The map on the right shows you how many open positions are available for judges in Riverside and San Bernardino County. And they needed help taking their case to Sacramento, the state capital, to argue, we need to make a change. And the reason it got to this place is uh, rooted in the fact the law says the number of judges allocated will be based on the population in 1990. So what has changed in these two counties in terms of population since 1990? Well, quite a lot. They've both grown quite a bit. And so um, led to a lot of discussion. We made the map and then you know what we realized? The map is not enough. And they were like, what? You, you, got, you, got, you, you make the maps, you, you're the experts. So, yeah, take a look at the chart. The chart does a much better job creating the argument that there is a huge disparity going on. I'll take the chart on this particular case. And sometimes that is what we need from folks. We need judgment from new students coming out of school. When do you show a chart? When do you show a statistic? When do you show a map? Yeah, you usually end up showing all of it, you know, kind of a show your work experience. Dashboards are great at show your work. This is a dashboard we call Know Your City. Just basic introduction, you know, when you've got tons of uh, turnover in an organization when elections come and go or um, new projects are funded or changes in personnel occur. You know, it's kind of nice to know your city. This is a dashboard where based on the map extent tells you how many people, what the unemployment rate is, um, the median household income within this map extent and etc. All of that is tied to a source web map. So the, the fact that the Living Atlas back here has tons of demographics. If I just type uh, or just go to the browse page and uh, we've got many categories of information. We've got base maps and imagery boundaries and we have a whole section on people which you probably call demographics. We've got all kinds of information available. Each one of these layers and web maps is potentially a source of data to power one of these dashboards. We like dashboards. I call them executive proof, you know, big numbers, clear colors, to the point, no drama, just here's the facts. Another way to go is to tell a story map and Living Atlas provides plenty of content um, for people to develop story maps. Uh, this is an example um, where I was inspired by that Sparklines map of COVID, but I realized that some of the um, decision makers I was dealing with in some national government organizations they needed something a little more clear, like which way are things going in my county? So I decided to make it purple and orange clear. It's either getting better, it's in orange, things are going down in terms of counts, or purple, things are going up. And the story map makes it uh, a pretty useful way for people to tell that story. So for some of you, your students might get interested in GIS, geography, etc., and it may turn out they're a better storyteller than they are an analyst. Well, that's okay because I think every data set, no matter how well done the cartography might be, let's for argument's sake say that this is at least a useful set of cartography, um, we still need to tell the story. We need people to write this stuff. So that's what we're interested in. And in this case, uh, it took the time to kind of write a story where I put Alaska and Hawaii first because they're always getting the short end of the stick, so to speak. So I made sure that, uh, um, I don't know, I just decided I would tell the story that way. Then I told the story based on the five biggest initial populations that dealt with COVID and, and so forth. So storytelling is a big part of what we're looking for. You know, and the challenge, I, I know as uh, educators, you deal with this as well. These are the types of challenges we all wish for. A clear problem to solve. We know how to solve it. We have all the data we need and we even have ideas. We know who our audience is. We have unlimited time and resources. But the reality is this is what we all usually face, including your students when they come to work for me or organizations I deal with. They're thrown into situations where they, they or their bosses may not quite know what the problem is to solve. When you talk racial disparity, that's one thing. How are we going to address it as a county or a city or a business? Like what are the things we can actually go after? Um, we're not sure how to solve it. We might have some data, 
we may have no ideas. We try to teach, you know, I, te I tell my staff all the time, stay calm. These are the questions. These are the issues that every project might face, but we're going to chip away at each one of these things and we look for places to start. So for example, a lot of content in Living Atlas, we are looking at what seems to be what we would call hard news, hurricanes, disasters, elections. Uh, that's not a joke, that's just a sequence of things I listed in an order. Um, policy changes, uh, I remember a Veterans Administration policy changed about who, who could get reimbursed for VA care if they live more than an hour from a VA facility, they wanted to make a change on that. So that's a, that's a, it's just inviting a map to be made. You know, if you change it to a two hour, you have to live two hours before you'll get reimbursed. Well, that's gonna affect a lot of people. Let's articulate who those people are. Um, big events like data updates, we have live feeds, but other data sets, live feeds of hurricanes and other weather, um, but other data sets like the census um, come out once a year for the census ACS. We filled the Living Atlas with, I think we're up to about 80 census ACS layers every November, December. I think it comes out in December. Um, and then census 2020, as soon as those numbers start flowing, they'll be available in Living Atlas as well as just a layer you just add. Um, but really the things we look for to put in Living Atlas are things, topics where a common set of facts would be useful. And we try to do it in a way that personalizes that data. So how do you make someone care about something? Well, show it how it is affecting their life. Um, for example, when all the, the wildfires were burning around me, I live right about here in Redlands, and you can kind of see I'm kind of surrounded, except on the west, by areas that have burned historically. So it got us thinking, I wonder if we overlaid all the census blocks with population with the burn areas, we might have just kind of a quick visual and that's what this is. Two layers pulled together from Living Atlas, A plus B, just a visual, nothing more than that, just trying to get a conversation started. That conversation might cause someone to say, well, I wonder how significant that is. Jim, you know, cute map trick you did, but tell me why I should care. Well, what if we could combine a wildfire risk layer in Living Atlas with a census demographic layer and produce a wildfire hazard potential score? And that's what my colleague Julia just completed on our team. Let's see here. And blogged about it and wrote a story map because we want to tell two things. We want to explain to folks how this analysis was done so people can kind of understand it. In this case, she made a nice visual animation of how the data looks at various scales, county, at the source, hex bin, and then um, I believe that is either, yeah, that's probably zip code or tracked, I can't tell. Um, and she wrote the entire story about how it works so that those who are interested in sort of the data aspect or the cartography aspect or the analysis aspect, they've got that available. And she's also writing a, um, a story map to tell the story. All those layers and their web maps, all these maps came from that one layer that uh, was created originally from two source Living Atlas layers. And lastly, that's the point that you gotta tell the story. So yeah, here's their story map called Wildfire in the Western United States. Julia happens to be married to a firefighter in Big Bear, a mountain community near us. So she, I think she had inside information on kind of uh, uh, to work with, or at least somebody to help her um, kind of uh, articulate what this means uh, today. And then on the right is the story of the layers and the maps and the usage of it. So kind of two different audiences, and that's something we talk about quite a bit. Lastly, I just wanna to say to all of you, I appreciate the career I've had because of educators like you who match up the things you want to teach and you feel need to be taught with the interests of your students. And the reason that's so critical to me, um, I just interviewed over, well, I probably interviewed 15 people. I probably saw 60 resumes and it came down to two or three people to fill a position. And I was a little surprised at the, um, some of the work, right? To be honest, not in the person that, you know, came to the, um, um, 
you know, who were the stronger candidates. I was surprised at some of uh, the work of uh, the broader pool and the work is never done. We need critical thinkers and we need them to understand they have to demonstrate and show evidence of their critical thinking in the maps and analysis that they do. So I kind of wrote this, we need critical thinkers who grow from pushing buttons in GIS and mapping. I started off digitizing. I was pushing buttons. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, over time, as each little additional thing is added to my knowledge base, my experience base, my career, my perspective broadens, it's people like you who foster that. We need those folks. We need to push them, right? We need to, I, I like those people who question, why am I pushing this button? What does it do? We want more inventive. Um, it's an awesome time in geography because of the capabilities of data, the act to data, the access to technology. So um, I just want to encourage all of you um, to try to use Living Atlas or at least use it as part of your um, curriculum. And I think Laura wants to spend a few minutes talking uh, specifics on that. And she's Hi, yes, <clears throat> I'm here. Um, thank you, Jim. That's very inspiring. Um, all the things that you've shown us and some really cool ways to use Living Atlas to um, have different layers going, what you would like to um, do, ways you can include that in all the different things you're trying to teach about and so forth. There's also some really cool ways that you can use Living Atlas uh, as a resource um, for example, um, Jim showed being able to um, use the join features uh, tool to combine maybe some of your data, some different Living Atlas layers. Um, one of the things I like to uh, also think about, and I'm sure you do too when you're teaching, um, you try to have your students use some local data or some primary source data. Maybe it's something um, from your own research that you get students interested in by having them look at data. So you can also do things like if you have a spreadsheet and you have a whole uh, bunch of, of different um, data in there and you want to uh, create something more than a point layer, for example, you can actually use some of the boundary layers that are in Living Atlas to be able to pull that in and map things in different ways. So keep that in mind too. And I uh, just wanted to finish up here by um, showing you a couple of the uh, resources that we have. And let me just quickly share my screen. Let me do it this way. And I'm just going to go here. Um, we do have a Living Atlas course in Esri training. And it's really easy to find if you just go into our catalog page at esri.com slash training and type in uh, Living Atlas and um, you will get that course right here at the beginning, Teaching with ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World. It's a really nice little course. It's about a half a day, um, and it, it kind of takes the perspective of an instructor to walk through some of the basics about Living Atlas, if you're not real familiar with it, different ways to access it, different uh, things that you can that you can do uh, with it. Some of them are, are things you can do with existing layers in the Living Atlas um, in different ways. So it's got some real good ideas and information in there. I'm also working with Joseph on creating a, a follow-up course that does show some of the things that you can do with transferring attributes and hopefully that will be ready for you by the end of the year. In addition, um, we have uh, the learn ArcGIS.com area, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And for your students, there are several lessons that may be interesting to you to share with your students or have them do in order to get used to looking in the Living Atlas for things. For example, there's this Get Started with ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World uh, lesson in here that gets people going and looking at different things. There's uh, Make a Fire Map, Make a Map in a Minute, uh, and then there's this one, uh, make an earthquake map. So all of these use are just living out of the world layers and, and information in different ways to get them going thinking through some of the things that Jim was talking about. So those are some great places to get started. Um, and with that, I'll just turn it back over to, um, to Rena and she can get us started on the Q&A.
Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Thank you so much, James. Um, so let's let's open for the QA. So um, Joseph, this is, are there some questions already in the chat? Yeah, well, I'm uh, I've responded screen. to a few of them and uh, Jim responded. And so we've got some, some good questions that came in. And uh, yes, folks, uh, all of these webinars are archived. If you look up the link that I've got up there, Rena always is very diligent about putting those recordings up as soon as she gets the notice that they're done. So they're actually all there. So if you want, you could look at some past months. We've had some really great uh, uh, monthly chats going back to what, Rena, June, something like that. So feel free to tap into the archives too. Yes, and also feel free if you want to unmute and talk directly with the presenter, with Jim, with Laura. We have a few time for that. I see. Uh, to kind of, while you get your while you find your unmute button, I see one question was um, with regard to what's coming in Living Atlas soon. Um, well, I can't really tell you without getting in trouble, um, but we do meet every week. Um, we just had a release uh, recently, so the place I always go to is uh, blogs.arcgis.com. I'll type it in the chat, arcgis.com. And there's a what's new, oh, sorry, I, put, I didn't put the HTTPS. Well, you can handle that. Um, in blogs.arcgis.com, anytime there's anything new in Living Atlas, and there are usually about a dozen or more every month. Um, that's where we go and we talk about it there. Um, so that's another great place to bookmark, just stay in tune with uh, what's the latest. Um, we just updated the BLS monthly unemployment figures. The wildfire risk layer I showed is new and available there. And uh, there's a USDA based um, national wildfire history layer that just got published there. Uh, those are just a couple of top of my head. More questions. Hey, James, I think Karen has a good question in here is Karen Bursley. What do you know for a quick five minute way to start with what is GIS prior to sharing their Living Atlas data? What's a quick five minute way? To start yeah. with what is let me, GIS? Let me just <laughs> clarify. I can clarify. Hi, everyone. Hi. But we're going to be talking to high school kids about about COVID and about various things, but I, I just wanted them, I want to start out, before I start showing them all this stuff, they have to kind of understand what GIS is, but they have no yeah. idea, you know, about that. I just wanted to be able to start with a, I mean, I can make something up, but if there's something there already that's just the basics, what makes something a GIS? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll look. Joseph, do you know of anything off the top of your head? I know there's the Esri channel on YouTube, and I'm just going there, but... Uh... Yeah, I I love some of the Esri five-minute uh, What is GIS videos. There's one from Esri Ireland also, which, you know, has some cool accents in it. Um, and also the uh, mapping hour videos that uh, my colleagues and I created back in the spring when the, all the disruption happened. They're actually aimed at... Uh, parents homeschooling and teachers now teaching online. So those, some of those elements might be good too, because we do go into the, the, we start with what is a digital map? Why do we care about it? What is GIS? So, yep. And Jim's got a link in there too. So hopefully yeah. those will be helpful, Karen. And, uh, you know, as Michelle mentioned the geospatial revolution, I still like those. I still use those as well. The trailer for the geospatial revolution is a good one. You know, it's a little dated now, but it's still relevant. And there are some forward thinking things like holding your phone to, to infrastructure and getting information. So there's some forward looking things in that video, even though it's 10 years old. And I'd like to just add to um, Karen, there's a, a course uh, on the training site that's, that you can actually access anonymously. It's more than five minutes, it's uh, about an hour, but it's, it's um, called Exploring GIS Maps. And it's really the first of five that are pretty basic um, intended for high school students. And so you could even um, look through there it, and there's also an educator guide associated with it that has some additional links. One of them is to the video that Joseph was just talking about, but there's some videos within the course too. So you might be able to either have students do that or, um, or steal some ideas from there. 
And two I questions, two oh. questions I answered in the chat was um, one: this the COVID data I showed is available at the state and county level. And uh, again, if you go to the blogs.arceus.com site and just search COVID, you'll find um, source uh, links and stories behind the source data. And then Diana, you also had a question about international data and living atlas. We have uh, more than um, 100 countries represented. We are committed to uh, adding more and more international data in Living Atlas, both global in scope, regional in scope, uh, national in scope. In fact, we have meetings with uh, 110 people from Esri distributors around the world um, three nights this week where we're talking nothing other than how can those distributors add more useful content for their regions into Living Atlas. So uh, it's not just a small team in Redlands working on this. It's um, people all around the globe are thinking about how to get this data into your hands. Can I jump in with a question? Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Michelle Kinzel. And um, I have a little bit of, um, kind of a conundrum. I'm teaching a course for uh, a university in China. It's an environmental GIS course, and they were supposed to be doing story maps for their final projects next week. And I've just found out that they're on lockdown in the apartments at the university, so they're not gonna be able to go home. And the internet, oddly enough, isn't um, letting them access the story map uh, template making page. So. Uh, I am going to explore the course that Laura introduced on teaching with the Living Atlas. I wondered if anybody had any tips for something I can put together at the last minute. Here's what I'm working on is I need to provide them with the data sets and they, they all have ArcGIS software, but their internet is just not reliable. Does anybody have any quick uh, advice for me on what they can do for a semester project? Again, it's an environmental GIS course. We have gone through um, modeling and all different kinds of um, environmental applications for GIS and it is a college level course. So if you were in this situation, what would you have them create that they could turn into you for a final project? Michelle, can they collect any data out in the field wherever they happen to be located? No, it, nope. this is very last minute. I mean, this is, I just found out okay. last night and this is their last week. So, so they couldn't collect just like five trees and five light poles and stuff like that in their community and then, and then map it? I can see if they have GPS units, but I'm doubtful. There's a hundred students in the class and I'll, I'll check, I'll check on that, but I don't think they have the, the units. I know you said, dear, um, internet might be questionable, but uh, anyway, I put this link to the apps page. There's several environmentally focused apps there that you could have them just um, look at water or um, look at um, other environmental topics among those apps and have them do a little bit of effort and research to look at areas they live in versus areas they're concerned about, do comparisons. Um, take screenshots, you know, if they have limited bandwidth, boy, if they can get it up on the screen, take a picture of it, then, then maybe that's a useful thing. Just brainstorming. Thank you, Jim. So, Michelle, do they have very limited um, access to internet or none at all? They have, it's really limited. We were trying to do the ESRI My Training course and mm -hmm. um, the spatial analysis and they they can't even load the fancy graphics for the ESRI my training um, okay. so what's uh, happening is they're on forced lockdown and so they're all confined to their dorms and they're just overwhelmed because all of the students are now staying on campus instead of being able to go home mm -hmm. and so what's happened is they've gotten an influx of people again because they went into lockdown and so they've got you know 10 times the population trying to access their bandwidth right now so there it's it's very sudden i see i see and this is the the last the last the end of the semester or is the beginning or it's, it's um, the last it's the last week of the course and so for my final exams no problem i'm giving them a paper version instead of the online exam but for their project they're all stuck they do have the esri software on their own laptops and so uh, they have an uh, arcmap or just pro 
map. 10.6. 10.6, okay. 10.6, but just more. We, yes. How about you give us uh, your email? We we get back to you then with with more ideas. Beautiful, thank yeah. you. Yeah, just just put the email so um, we have it in here. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate All it. Right. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna uh, stop the recording and say thank you to all of you. Um, don't forget November education chat is ArcGIS Hub. It's really good for data sharing, student project and community engagement. Uh, feel free to contact us. That's the email on the, on the slide. I just stopped the recording now, but Jim, Laura and I and Joseph will stay for another eight minutes if you still want to ask questions and stay with us and chat with us. Thank you.